Ableton on Air major sponsorship was given by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Also sponsorship was given by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together, and Champlain Community Services of Vermont. Hello and welcome to Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Thank you to our sponsors, Green Mountain Support Services, Champlain Community Services, and Washington County Mental Health. Arlene couldn't be here today, but on this, uh, on this um, informative episode, we will focus on the Montpelier Regional Planning Commission. Uh, thank you for joining me on this edition of um, Able to Air again for the second time. Uh, with mm -hmm. us to discuss uh, transportation and people with special needs is Dan Courier and um, can you Peter Jonke and Peter Jonke from uh, Vermont's VCIL uh, organization. Uh, welcome to Able to Air. Thank you for having us back. Um, thank you. Uh, 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 you are welcome. What are the missions and goals of the Montpelier Regional Planning? Is it a commission or a council? Or sure, yeah. sure. It's uh, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And so um, our goal is really to work with our municipalities uh, to provide uh, local and regional planning. Um, mm -hmm. And one of those um, you know, missions is to work through uh, public transit. So when you say m uh, municipalities, that means mm -hmm. federal, state, and local organizations, right? Yeah, we bring together a, a series of partners, whether it's federal partners like Agency of Transportation, uh, Federal Highway, mm -hmm. um, and then our local partners just at the town level, say the city of Montpelier or the city of Barrie could come in and, and work with us as well. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about the um, transportation, the, uh, the board, uh, the transportation board that you have with your organization, which I'm also a part of. Sure. Um, can you explain yep. that, please? Yeah, so uh, as part of the inclusive planning grant that we were awarded, we, um, we formed a, um, a paratransit planning committee. And so uh, that committee uh, helped to work through the, the goals of our grant, um, and uh, which was basically to engage directly with the transit users um, along the, with inside of the Green Mountain Transit Service area, which is in Washington County, mm -hmm. and to to engage with them on a way to understand uh, what their needs are um, as new routes are being proposed by Green Mountain Transit. So one of the options that Green Mountain Transit has put forward is to start a, um, a new paratransit service mm -hmm. uh, where you would have vehicles uh, traveling directly to the door of uh, passengers and they would get that ride directly from their door to the door of their destination. Can you define paratransit? What exactly is that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, paratransit is really, it's a, it's a federal requirement that um, uh, transit services have uh, to provide trips for um, older adults and uh, persons with disabilities um, to go to medical appointments primarily, um, but it can do social trips as well. Um, and so it's a requirement from the Americans with Disabilities Act on the transit agencies. Uh, uh, Peter, through your organization, VCIL, um, how does VCIL or has, how has your organization worked with the Regional Planning Commission? Well, we were um, one, of, uh, one of a partner agencies on the grant along with the Council on Aging, um, and we were sort of specifically focusing on some of the needs of people with disabilities. I myself uh, don't drive, and so therefore I'm a user of public transit. Um, and <clears throat> so we partnered uh, on this particular project but um, one of my functions at the Vermont Center for Independent Living is as a transportation advocate. So I'm always working um, with either Dan or other partners or the VTRANS, the trans uh, state agency for transportation, uh, to make sure that people with disabilities have the same opportunities for transit that other people have. Um, and, yeah. and as Dan said, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, you uh, transit providers uh, are required to provide what's called complementary paratransit services. Um, and just to clarify, 
Um, that currently doesn't exist in the central Vermont area. Um, right now, with a few exceptions, it really only exists in Chittenden County. The way the transit provider accomplishes the same end is they have what are called deviated fixed routes. So basically, it's a fixed route. Uh, bus goes, you know, starts at one point and goes to another point, but it can deviate off of that route up to three quarters of a mile, which is essentially the same requirement under true complementary paratransit. Under true complementary paratransit, uh, every route that a transit provider has would have to have a complementary route that would mimic that same route, but would be able to go off um, the, the route up to three quarters of a mile. Um, so for like medical appointments and... For anything, that's uh, under true complementary paratransit. It doesn't have to be just medical appointments. It can be for anything. Uh, just in the same way you could, if you didn't need, uh, if you didn't have a disability and didn't, could get to the bus stop, you get on a bus, you go wherever you want to go as long as the bus goes there. Um, and in the same way with paratransit services, in the, the only difference being is that the bus uh, would, uh, you would call up the day, uh, you have to call up a day ahead of time and the bus would come uh, to your house, they're going to come to your curb. Um, just to clarify a point, it, it's curb to curb service. Uh, there are other services that some transit providers provide that is literally door to door where drivers or other people can assist people actually getting into their home. But I don't want to get people confused if you know, the paratransit service that is required under the law is a curb to curb service. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it just means that uh, a driver would uh, bring you to your home and then get out of the car or van and bring you to your door? Well, bring you, so for, we, we, for example, we have uh, staff people at VCIL, and so they get picked up at their house, so the van pulls up to their driveway, they walk from their door out to the, out to the, the, the bus, uh, it's a van, um, and they get on, and then that, that van brings them to a VCIL, and they drop them off at the front door, um, and they come in and walk into the, into the office. And so that's, that's the way that would typically work in when a situation. When does that, or when will that start with the um, power transit uh, service? Well, it, it's proposed. We don't have an exact date yet. It's still going through an evolutionary process, unless, Dan, you have any updates. Um, I haven't heard any further. So uh, there was a presentation last night at our Transportation Advisory Committee meeting, which is a different committee than the, the Paratransit Planning Committee that we formed. But at that meeting, Green Mountain Transit presented on the, the Next Gen study that includes this option of paratransit. What is the, ne the yep. Next Gen study? Uh, the Next Gen was a comprehensive transit analysis of all of Green Mountain Transit services mm -hmm. uh, to figure out ways to streamline services, improve services, um, really to either have a cost neutral adjustment or even a cost savings uh, to a service uh, by doing, you know, whether it's, you know, running of the bus at different times or offering... Changing the time. Yeah, or... it could change the times. It could offer a slightly different route for the bus to travel. Speaking about different routes, uh, I noticed also that sometimes uh, GMTA runs a bus and it says special mm -hmm. on the bus. Yep. Uh, what exactly, does that go any particular place or is, is that a special route? for? T typically special... Um, is a, uh, uh, means it's a Medicaid trip. Okay. So the, the, all the transit providers across the state have a contract with Medicaid to provide trips specifically for Medicaid. But it could be some other just non-regular transit route trip. Um, it doesn't have to be a, be a Medicaid trip, but typically they are. Um, sometimes you'll see some of those, that, and they'll actually say, um, like, Twin Valley Senior Center, so that's where that bus is going, or mm -hmm. Project Independence, and so that's where that bus is going. But, or a methadone clinic, for example. Um, well, it probably wouldn't say that, <laughs> just for privacy purposes. It would say special. It would <laughs> say special, exactly. Yeah. That's that's basically why they do that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lawrence, can I just finish uh, yes, my sir. point about Green Mountain Transit? They said that they're looking to start the new routes and make all the changes in our county in September of this year. And so um, anything that would go into effect would start in September, which would time with the opening of the transit center here in Montpelier. Explain a little yep. bit about that since you said the, yep. the transit center. 
Sure. So the transit center will be a new uh, base of operations for, um, for the buses here in Montpelier for, that serve the Washington County area, uh, but also for buses that come out of Burlington or even Stagecoach, which comes out of Randolph. And so they would go there, and that would be the primary transit um, stop. And um, those red buses yeah. also, the, the rule, yep. uh, because the, I'm going to be asking questions about the, uh, you, you know, what's the difference between the local transit that we have here and those red buses, where do they end up yeah, going? Yeah, so th those are buses out of RCT, um, and so those that's a, a the, the Rural County Transportation, I believe is what their acronym is. Um, rural, rural Community rural Transit. Community, thank you. Yep. And so, um, and they operate out of St. Johnsbury and they serve the uh, Northeast Kingdom mm -hmm. uh, with their buses. And so that particular bus that comes in, that's a bus that's running along Route 2. Um, so that's part of the Route 2 commuter route. So if, in terms of rural transportation, because I know if you live in the mountains, it's really hard to get places. Mm -hmm. it, it, let's say by the year 2020, is transportation for people with disabilities going to change even more? Or are there any more situations that are going to change there? Or, Well, th that depends. Um, the state, uh, VTrans, is doing a lot of work to figure out different options to, inc to increase options for transportation, mm -hmm. um, meaning that we want to give people more choices. And I mean, I'll use myself as an example. I live in East Calais. Um, there is no bus in East Calais. And I don't think there's ever going to be a bus in East Calais. So um, when you look at transportation options, you really have to broaden the way you think about it. Um, VTrans has a really good website called Go Vermont. Um, mm -hmm. And if you go to that site, you can look at many of the options that you have. Um, and people don't always think about it, but ride sharing, sh sharing a ride with a neighbor, mm -hmm. is one transportation option. And that's, I do that all the time. Um, that's how I primarily get to work and get back home. Um, sometimes I do take the, the RCT bus, the red bus, uh, back toward um, Marshfield, and then my wife picks me up from there. But so there's, there's lots of things. And the state is also looking at uh, some technology to improve so that somebody can go online or if they have a smartphone, they can look, and it will tell them all the different options that are there. And it might, it might be one of these, it's not in place yet, but the proposed, there might be one of these, quote, special buses that yeah. happens to be out in that neighborhood, mm -hmm. and there would hopefully be a way that then they can connect with that bus and, oh, yeah, I can pop on and go there. So these are sort of the things that are being working. So that it's not so much that they're going to increase this number of vehicles actually on the road, but we're going to be taking more advantage so everybody knows where all the vehicles are and maybe they can uh, jump ride on one of them. Uh, uh, when the commission did, uh, when your organization did that survey, mm -hmm. okay, obviously there's pros and cons to everything. Not everybody's going to be satisfied with everything that, a, that the state of Vermont or a state offers. What um, are some of the pros and cons, or what, what what were some of the things discussed in that survey? Yeah. How has the survey improved the situation, and mm -hmm. so on? So the, the survey was meant to inform us as Green Mountain Transit moved forward in their planning for the paratransit, to really make sure that, one, the service um, was offered in a way that people would take the most advantage of. Mm -hmm. And so some of the, you know, some of the input that we got, you know, was that, you know, they, re people really do, w people would like to have the door to door, right? They, having it at the curb isn't necessarily the best option, especially during the winter when people have to walk from their doorstep out to the edge of the curb. Or maybe having it seven days a week because other big cities mm -hmm. like New York, Boston, yep. and so on. Uh, have services seven days a week. It's just a matter of employing drivers and the budget because mm -hmm. you know budget is a big factor. Yep. Yeah. And people, uh, people did report say you know that it would help them to have more service on weekends mm -hmm. and later in the evening. Did as Vermont well. used to have weekend service, or did they cut back? 
No, uh, I don't think we've ever operated on Sunday, for instance. I know Saturday service was, has, has always existed, but sometimes they have to limit it to mm -hmm. the number of hours they can operate. Um, but right now what we have is pretty much as, as expansion of a service as we've ever had. And so with, excluding Sundays, which we've never really operated on. Um, the, the paratransit, you know, the other input that we got was that there's a qualification process that you'd go through. Mm -hmm. And on that qualification side, it would be nice to have a seasonal qualification to make sure that people that are older adults or people with disabilities that aren't as mobile during the winter time could qualify for that service. So they could get the trip that they would want or need um, that they can easily get in the summer because they can walk to the bus stop, but in the winter they can't walk that far. And, or and the a, a trip be... to a ski resort, is, even though the, the buses run there mm -hmm. seasonally, that would be considered an important trip or... Well, uh, so again, paratransit would be for any trip. Um, to get a trip all the way out to the ski resorts would be something that they would have to schedule in advance mm -hmm. if they wanted to take advantage of you know, recreating. I just have to say on that same you know, token, a lot of people reported you know, about 40% of the people that answered our survey said that they would want social trips to make sure they were included and that they were as important as medical trips uh, to them. And social so, trips meaning what? Oh, going, having fun, you know, going to the movies, being able to go out to dinner with friends, going to church, you know, anything that's a social activity, not related to a medical appointment or, or visiting a doctor or even, you know, going to like, you know. Or going shopping. Shopping, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So GMTA offers volunteer drivers, I notice sometimes too. Yeah. Is, this, is this part of the paratransit or is this going to be included? Volunteer in drivers would be a separate, it's still a separate program. They use volunteer drivers to help provide some of those medical trips. Um, it's the uh, G Green Mountain Transit is, uh, has to, when it, when it has a trip scheduled, it has to ask itself, what's the lowest cost way to move this person? And you, typically it's through a volunteer driver. Um, and so, and then if the volunteer driver isn't available, they can do a deviation on the bus. Um, there's other options too. You can have a driver uh, through Green Mountain Transit take one of their cars out to pick up the person as well. What are some of the Peter? What are some of the pros and cons that you see wrong with the system, and how GMTA or how through the commission uh, um, um, you could improve service because you're using the service yourself. Sure. Um, and I mean, a, a lot of this is what we, what we found through this whole process of the surveys is there's a lot of need to both improve education, both for drivers in terms of understanding better how to interact with people with disabilities, uh, especially people who don't have... Have you seen that a problem in the past? Uh, sometimes, in, especially in terms of people who may not have visible disabilities. Um, that sometimes is a problem, somebody who may have... Um, uh, learning disability or something, a cognitive disability, and it, they may look perfectly healthy and don't have a mobility issue, but they may have a difficulty understanding directions or those kinds of things. Um, or somebody who just has a hearing loss. Um, and so, you know, somebody has to either speak up a little bit or make it a little clearer what, what in instructions are being said or information. People who are blind, um, I, you know, I mean, I, I personally haven't experienced it, but uh, there are many a stories out there where a person gets on a bus with a has the white cane that identifies them as a person who's blind, and the person says to the driver, um, "I need to get off at you know Elm Street and State Street." And uh, the driver says, "Well, just ring the bell, and well, I'll stop." Well, that obviously doesn't help because the person is blind; they can't see where the bus is going. So. Um, you know, the driver should recognize, oh, this is a person with a white cane. I need to pay attention to where they need to get off because they, they can't. So, um, so there's that education. piece. you think piece. it's more like, uh, it's not being it, um, ignorant. They just don't know enough about people with disabilities. Correct. Right? It's just an educational piece. But on the same, on the same side, there also needs to be a, be a part in terms of educating riders so they know what their responsibilities are as well. And so... Under, what do you mean by educating riders? Well, um, for example, if, if they need a, a ride under the current um, system of elderly and disabled transportation, they have to call f uh, two business days ahead of time to schedule a ride. So, you know, if they're calling the day before, 
and then that they need to be educated that they, their expectation of getting that ride is going to be pretty low because the transit provider isn't that nimble. They don't have enough volunteers to m maneuver that quickly. Um, and just understanding different ways that, you know, that they have to have the correct change. The drivers don't give out change and those kinds of things. So, uh, you know, there's, there's educational benefits on, on either side. Um, I think the biggest um, part, uh, as uh, with this uh, GMT wants to do this next gen and put in a formal paratransit, as we talked before, um, one of the things that, that I will be looking at very carefully in, uh, in terms of working with people with disabilities is, as Dan said, there's an application process for that uh, part of the, the trip. And it's not just, you know, oh, I have a disability and you send it in. You have to have a doctor's note. You have to have, and you actually have to go and be interviewed because what the transit provider is looking for, and I'm, I'm not necessarily faulting the transit provider because this is true across the country. This isn't just unique to Vermont. Um, th this type of trip is more expensive, obviously, than just getting on a regular bus. So they try to limit the cost. And so they want to know what this person's functional limitations are getting from where they are, either at home or work or where they, to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have to go through this interview process. They might meet with a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Um, and so that process is a barrier to some people. And so that's, that's something we'll be looking at very carefully. Talk, um, uh, sorry to interrupt. Talk about some of the other barriers because we, when we talk about customer service, mm -hmm. right? especially with drivers and people driving people places, uh, you know, how important is the customer service aspect when you're dealing with people with disabilities? Like, in, the in, real meat of it. In, well, in, in my mind, it's, it's no different than dealing with anybody else. I mean, if, if a non-disabled person gets on a bus, they want to be treated as they're the customer, they're, uh, this, the bus service is providing a service to them, um, so they need to be treated with respect. Um, and so it's the same thing for a person with a disability. It doesn't change. It's, it's, a, it's the same thing. But as you, as you pointed out, uh, drivers don't always have experience in terms of dealing with interacting with people with disabilities. So that's why we would want to do Dan, do, do you want to talk, do you want to piggyback on that about customer service and people with special needs? Well, sure. I mean, some of the barriers that, you know, during our um, engagement, you know, we listed off a number of barriers. You know, we came up with nine barriers in total. You know, some of the other ones that were included, you know, was just beyond the education, which came up, was, was really intertwined in all the barriers. You know, just like, you know, making it easier for people to, you know, make that, call in and make that trip, right? Understanding how you, you know, you schedule the appointment, um, you know, what the driver, when it comes to pick you up, what their expectation is of you. And so really working through the barriers of, of not just scheduling it, but then, you know, having the ride. Um, additionally, you know, they talked about um, bus stops and the need for um, improvements to the bus stops. And so there's a lot of bus what stops. Of, uh, what type of improvement? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of bus stops that um, don't have a shelter or don't have benches to sit at. Or the shelter... Yeah. For example, by Walmart, mm -hmm. or near that parking lot area, the bus shelter, the benches are broken. Yeah. You know, certain things. Exactly. And so, um, you know, and there's a lot of people that have limited mobility, and so they might be able to walk to the bus stop, but not having a place to sit, to stay out of the weather, to rest, you know. There may be a metal condition that prevents them from standing for long periods of time. But also, you don't want the shelters, you know, people congregating there, me meaning sleeping at the shelter mm -hmm. or, you know, because that, that's also the case. People might, okay, it's a nice day, I'm going to cop a nap. A, a shelter is not meant for that. It's just meant for waiting for the bus. Yeah. I'm, I, can, I have no direct knowledge of the, that, that happening, but I'm sure it does. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it, a lot of the shelters, besides just improved shelters, also improving the way uh, the, the, way the buses um, have... Um, when a bus pulls up to a shelter or a bus stop, making sure they can get off the travel lane, get out of the travel lane so cars can pass by, mm -hmm. and so offer that slip lane um, or uh, even a driveway that it can access. Uh, what about having, has this suggestion come up where uh, a bus pulls up and the stop, you know, 
you know, we're here at the, mm -hmm. does, is there uh, like going to be a computerized voice? Well, right now the drivers are expected to say the stop name and announce the stop for the riders as well before they get there, but any passengers getting on mm -hmm. should also be notified. And so that is a, a requirement for their drivers right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully they're doing that. We've heard that they don't always, but I was on the bus the other day and he, he did. He did announce the stops and that was encouraging to hear. Um, so it's feedback that we've provided to Green Mountain Transit as already. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, so we'll continue to provide that feedback if we hear from other people that they're not getting the announcements. Um, what are some of the other, as far as the commission, uh, what are some of the other goals of the commission that you guys are bringing forth? Because I know that, uh, um, that you guys, that uh, you guys help produce some public service announcements. Yeah. But what are some of the other things that the commission is doing? Yeah. I mean, we're really out to enhance safety for our transportation network. So, you know, think bicycle and pedestrian as well, you know, where you've got pedestrians that are at crosswalks and they need to cross safely, you know, making sure that you've got, you know, visibility um, as well as, you know, uh, correct markings on the roadways for pedestrians. Are you guys in and, charge of that new bike path that's being put in? Um, our office was involved in the planning phase, which was about 10 years ago. And so that project is was developed by the, after we helped the them to the planning, it now is a project, the construction portion is being managed by the city of Montpelier. Mm -hmm. And so, and they've kind of taken that over. What are some of the other, uh, Peter, what are some of the other, um, in your opinion, um, things that could be done by the commission or more improvements that you think that might? Well, I, I want to just piggyback one thing Dan said, because it, it is a big problem. We talked about bicycle and pedestrian uh, mm -hmm. stuff. And that's also another uh, transit option. Um, we don't think of it as, as walking as an option to get from point A to point B, but it absolutely is. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, another example, if, if I had um, my druthers, it wouldn't work very well in the wintertime. But from where I live, if I had an uh, e-bike, an, e an electric bike, mm -hmm. um, I could um, go from my house to the uh, bus stop in Marshfield, catch the Route 2 commuter into town, and then go back the, the same way. And of course, coming to work wouldn't be too bad because it's all downhill, but getting home is where I really need the electric bike <laughs> part because that's uphill. So, but that's, an, that's another transportation option. And, what, and to make this really clear, it's what we call the first and last mile, that those are, those are the big hurdles that we all try to get over. And so in this case, a bike would accomplish that closing that gap mm -hmm. of that first and last mile. But the other part of bike and pedestrian stuff is if we look not only in Vermont, because I get weekly statistics on uh, traffic fatalities, and so far this year we've been doing much better than in past years, um, but pedestrian fatalities are going up nationwide, both in Vermont and across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a real concern. Um, and it's a, it's a much broader issue. Do we really need to do a paradigm shift? Right now, car manufacturers have, the, up till now, they've really been focusing on passenger and driver safety and seat belts mm -hmm. and airbags and all of those things. But we need to really look at possibilities for vehicle design, road design, all those kinds of things to make, pa to make pedestrian much more safe because if we want to make cities more walkable, if we want to get people out of their cars for you know greenhouse gas emission reduction, then we've really got to look at that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it, um, what are some of the? Um, <clears throat> I asked this to all my guests. What are some of the misconceptions, especially around customers, with people with disabilities? What are some of the misconceptions around people with special needs when people first meet them that maybe a driver might not know? how to treat a person with disability? Um, well, I, I think, um, again, uh, it varies um, depending on the disability. Um, um, well, I mean, probably one of the, um, you know, if, if somebody's deaf, um, you know, they're going to be have to use notes to write back and forth. If, you know, the person may not know exactly, maybe this is the first time they've been on the bus. And so, or, the, or it's a different route. And so they're going to have to ask the driver, you know, where do I get off to go to? And they're going to have to write a note because um, they may not speak or or hear. And the driver's going to have to you know write a note back or 
indicate through some hand signals that you know he'll stop and let them know that here's where they have to get off. Um, but those are part of the issue. I think is just because um, drivers, being in a small rural area, drivers don't have as much interaction with people with a variety and a wide spectrum of disabilities. So there's not that interaction. Some drivers are great. Some drivers, you know, I've had personal experience. Um, you know, I would say 99.9% .9 of the drivers I've worked with are wonderful, and they make an effort. They may not get it perfect, but we're all human, um, and they make an effort. And um, you know, I'll point out to drivers if, if I see something that's not appropriate. You know, I'll either say something to them if it seems appropriate to do that, or report them uh, to the transit agency, um, because it's just it's really a matter of educating them and um, you know making them aware of, of, of what the, what the needs are. Dan, your take on that? No, well, I, some of the misconceptions around people with special needs, especially mm -hmm. when drivers are dealing with people with disabilities. Well, I think um, the education piece is going to be really important. You know, I think we, um, uh, I think there's a lot of um, additional um, uh, when people see someone with a special need, I think they take you know and try to make that extra effort, um, which may or may not be necessary. And so, um, you know, having a real um, understanding of what kind of special needs uh, people you'll experience, you know, and, and, and provide services for is going to be important. Um, yeah. But also just, you know, don't set limitations, right? You know, treat them like any human being, yeah. you know, and so. Yeah, I think it's important yeah. not to make judgments. I'll use an example. Um, people with multiple sclerosis uh, can have a wide range of um, good days, bad days, some days where they're moving around and fairly mobile and you wouldn't know that they have a disabilities and the next day they can barely walk. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the things as Dan pointed out on the surveys um, was a need for um, conditional, what's, what's called condi conditional um, eligibility for paratransit services. And that actually does exist under the law. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's you know in the winter time, then somebody can get the services that they don't necessarily need in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But somebody who makes the effort to go through this application process that has multiple sclerosis would probably have the capacity to one day be able to call up and say, "I need a paratransit ride today," and then you know the next three days they may be fine, and so they're not calling, and then all of a sudden they're calling again, and so. You you know drivers may you know say well, what's going on with this person you know mm -hmm. well it's just the nature of their disability. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of future goals of the committee and mm -hmm. of your um, you know work with GMTA? Yeah, so um, you know um, we did apply for a second grant which we did not receive and mm -hmm. so um, we don't have any um, real money to help um, to do the, the outreach and the development of some um, educational material like we thought. Um, but really, the next steps for the committee um, are to come together around um, the outreach and engagement that Green Mountain Transit is doing on their, uh, their next-gen um, enhancements, uh, and just stay engaged when, um, if they decide to operate the paratransit, we've been asked as a committee to help them at Green Mountain Transit during the, um, the initial two weeks as well as the following two weeks afterwards just to stay in touch with the folks that we know um, that would be able to use the service to make sure that they understand the changes coming, understand how it operates, and really help them in the beginning of the service change. Um, I also want to make sure that, you know, just like Peter mentioned uh, with the, um, the form, you know, to get the, uh, the service and go through the um, the evaluation process. Um, Explain the yeah. evaluation process and how that would work real quick. Uh, I'm actually not well versed in it. That's why I want to stay engaged on it uh, so I can learn about it. Um, so really what it comes down to is that I don't, it's only operating, uh, paratransit's only operating in Chittenden County right now. So yeah. when yeah. paratransit becomes in full fruition, mm -hmm. does a person need to get, uh, just so we know, um, does the person need to get a doctor's signature on those forms in yeah. order to... Yes, a do they would need a, a doctor's signature on the forms, most definitely, a health care provider. Um, but as I said, it's, it's not, that, that isn't the only thing. I mean, they, there's uh, some, I, it's been a while since I've looked at the 
form from Chittenden County, yeah. but there's a lot of explanation of you know what it is that uh, prevents you from getting to the bus stop. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding, I haven't followed up on it, that at least in Chittenden County, uh, they've done a lot of mapping even of sidewalks, so they know uh, from if somebody lives in a certain place, g getting mm -hmm. to a particular bus stop, maybe the sidewalks aren't very good and aren't very passable. So somebody may be able to get a paratransit eligibility under those circumstances where somebody who lives maybe the same distance elsewhere but the sidewalks are in really good shape wouldn't be able to. Uh, so it, it really is very specific to the individual. Uh, but the other thing I want to also mention as, as we move forward to the paratransit, it's our hope uh, from this last planning grant um, that once this is also implemented completely in uh, the Washington County area, um, that right now um, in Chittenden County there is a what's called an ADA advisory committee for Green Mountain Transit and we're hoping that uh, we will be able to get some people also from uh, Washington County area once the paratransit is in place that could also be part of that same um, yep. ADA uh, advisory committee since we would be both having paratransit services. Uh, all right, so are there any, before we end, is, do you have anything else you want to add about your committee or in the power transit? And uh, we're also going to show a piece of that public service announcement. Is there anything yeah. else you want to? No, I mean, um, you know, uh, the the you know overall the engagement from the um, from our phase one um, study uh, was 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 above and beyond what I thought we would get. And mm -hmm. so I was really um, excited. You know, we engage really, uh, our numbers um, tell us that we engage with about 600 people, um, you know, on the, on paratransit, on the planning for it, as well as engaging through the survey and getting feedback. And so I just thought that was great. And so really it's gonna come down to making sure that we stay engaged and we let people that did say that they want more information know about the changes that are coming. Mm -hmm. And so make sure that they stay engaged as well. Yeah. If, um, if you can improve one mm -hmm. particular thing with the transit system as far as, mm -hmm. um, this is opinion, uh, 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 for people with disabilities, besides yeah. what's happening now, what would it be um, as far as your improvement? If I had to pick one improvement, I'd have yeah. to say I'd go down to the fundamentals and make sure that the bus stops, right, you know, that we would focus on improving the bus stops to make sure that the people uh, with disabilities that came there could at least, you know, have a safe, you know, dry place to, to wait. Uh, uh, your take on that question? Um, I would agree. We have to really go back to fundamentals, um, make sure drivers are educated about, um, you know, how to interact with people with disabilities. And I think it's also really important, even though this planning grant has ended and we don't have any formal engagement processes, um, you know, we really hope people, uh, if you're riding the bus or if you have questions about riding the bus and you're not sure, um, reach out um, either to myself at the Vermont Center for Independent Living or Dan or the transit provider, um, ask questions if you're confused about something. Uh, we definitely want feedback if you have good experiences riding, bad experiences mm -hmm. riding. So uh, we want to definitely keep the conversation going. Uh, for people that want to contact the commission, where can they turn? Yeah. So uh, you can call us at 802-229-0389 and ask for uh, Dan. Do you have, do you have, a, um, do you have a, a website? We do. It's centralvtplanning.org is our website. Okay. And they can also send me an email, which is courier, C-U-R-R-I-E-R, -R -E at cvregion.com. Okay. Uh, for those that want to contact VCIO in terms of this, where can they go? Sure, so they can contact the Vermont Center for Independent Living at 802-229-0501. Um, or you can email me at peter at vcil.org. Okay. Um, that's the easiest way. Okay. Uh, well, uh, since we have a couple of minutes, let's take a look at those public service announcements that uh, I had the pleasure of uh, working on with the, um, with the Regional Planning Commission of Montpelier and uh, also VCIL. Let's take a look at that. Hi, my name is Dale Hackett. I'm from Barrie, Vermont, and I used GMTA because I don't see well, 
and I don't hear well. So for me, there are some real communication challenges in my life. I like using the bus, one, because I don't have a driver's license, so I don't really have a choice. I would be tied down to Barry, Vermont only if I didn't use the bus. So what does the bus allow me to do? It allows me to leave Barry, Vermont. It can also do things like even allow me to get into town. If we get a northeaster with three feet of snow, which nobody really likes, but we especially don't like it when the sidewalks can't get plowed. Thankfully, we can hop on the bus right there where I live, and it will take us to a bus stop in downtown Barrie. We bypass the unplowed sidewalks. We can get off, go to the drugstore, get what we need in terms of um, pharmaceutical needs, medicines, and get back home. Otherwise, that would not be possible. Otherwise, in which I use the bus, I often during the winter will go up to the state house. I like doing advocacy work. Without the bus, I could not do that. Same thing during the summer, there's recreational activities. I can put a bike on the bus. I can ride a bike, even though I don't see well. Just, you probably want to get out of my way. Um, and I can go to Montpelier and use their bike pass. So the bus is very empowering. What about if you have a walker? They are very nice in this sense that we are a small rural city or town, and most of the bus drivers, if you use the bus, will get to know who you are. I'm not saying they'll know you by name, but still, they'll get to know wh who you are. And they will come to understand your needs. So I have seen the bus pull up, see who's there at the bus stop, get out, and immediately take the walker of the person that needs to get on the bus. The person uses the rails to get onto the bus and sits down, and the bus driver carries the walker onto the bus and puts it in the seat right beside them or puts them in the seat in front. That puts an end uh, to this edition of Able Done On Air. I would like to thank the Montpelier Regional Planning Commission and um, Peter Junkie from VCIL for joining us. Um, Arlene is off today, but um, thank you to our sponsors, um, Green Mountain Support Services, Champlain Community Services, and Washington County Mental Health. This puts an end to this edition of Able Down on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Ableton On Air major sponsorship was given by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disability to be home in the community. Also sponsorship was given by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together, and Champlain Community Services of Vermont.